When I ran with the Concordia cross country team on a few occasions, our coach took all our watches away while we were running track intervals. He would make us run an interval at a particular pace, for example, a 400 meter at 5K pace, and we would have no choice but to guess if we were running at the right pace. At the end of the interval, he would ask us to tell him what we thought our, our time was. At the time, I remember worrying that I wasn't getting the right workout because I couldn't monitor my pace during the interval. I had no way of knowing if I was on pace or off pace until it was too late, then the interval was done. What I didn't realize was that intrinsically knowing your pace without relying on external means is something that the elite runners do very well. In today's book, we will learn about other things the pros do well and that the rest of us should also learn from. Hi, and welcome to the Running Book Reviews podcast, where we review running books to help you decide if you'd like to read the book for yourself. We also hope that listening to us chat about running can help keep you motivated about your own running or inspire you to try something new. My name is Liz, and with my co-host, Alan, we're going to talk with authors Matt Fitzgerald and Ben Rosario about their book, Run Like a Pro Even If You're Slow. So let me tell you a little bit about the book. Run Like a Pro Even If You're Slow attempts to break down the key habits and traits of professional runners and make them available to the rest of us mere mortals. We tend to think the pros are somehow fundamentally different from the rest of us. But all of those differences are due to better lifestyle habits, more emotional intelligence, uh, and probably genes. But most of those things, not genetics, but most of those things, we can improve and get faster as a result of improving the other stuff. Chapter titles include the following. Follow the leaders, where you learn how the pros are not as different from you as you might think. And then various things in chapters that you should do like a pro. Plan, manage mileage, balance intensities, pace, stride, recover, eat, and think like a pro. And the chapters towards the end, I think uh, chapters 10 through 14, uh, contain a whole series of training plans for 5K, 10K, half marathon, marathon, and ultra marathon distances. Each chapter also finishes with a sort of coach's tip based on uh, Coach Ben Rosario's years of experience and coaching at a high level. So let me tell you a little bit about the authors if you don't already know who they are. If you have anything to do with running books, you probably have come across Matt Fitzgerald. He's a lifelong runner and endurance athlete, an acclaimed sports writer. And as authored and co-authored, I hesitate to try and guess the number of books, but it's more than 25. I think it might be 28 or 29, but I can't remember the number. He's a running and triathlon coach, certified sports nutritionist, a journalist who's written for many sports journals. I could go through every sports journal that you've ever heard of, probably, uh, and magazine. Uh, he also has a website called mattfitzgerald.org and is co-founder of the 8020 Endurance Training website. I guess having not written the book 8020 in the past. Moving on to Ben, Ben Rosario. Was a high-level runner in his high school and college years, so has uh, running experience. Currently the head coach of the Hoka Northern Arizona Elite Professional Distance Running Team in Flagstaff, Arizona. His athletes have finished, have finished top 10 at many major marathons, including Boston, Chicago, New York, and London, uh, and won uh, numerous national titles. I guess one of the most well-known ones that's, that, that, that's happened recently would be uh, Alephine Tillyamuk's um, first place at the Olympic Trials Marathon in 2020. In his past life, Ben co-owned a specialty running shop in St. Louis, Missouri called Big River Run Company. He's also co-authored two previous books, both about running, called Inside a Marathon and Tradition, Class and Pride. Welcome, Matt and Ben. Thank you. Hopefully I got most of the stuff there. Don't know whether you can remember the number of books, um, Matt. No, um, it depends a little <laughs> bit how you count. Uh, the example I always give when I'm asked this question is like, I, I you know, I published a training diary, uh, which is like, is that a book or not? You know, because all I did was write an intro and the rest of it's just like a, an empty journal for the, for the reader to fill. So yeah. does that count? If so, it could be 30. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to say it doesn't count then 29 it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good call. I think that's right. <laughs> okay, so why why don't you guys start off by telling uh, our listeners how you came about to to write this book together? Ben, I'll let you go first. 
Oh, sure. Uh, well, as, as some of the listeners may know or may not know, Matt and I knew each other a little bit before this, but he came to me a few years ago, maybe in December of 2016, and asked if he could come to Flagstaff and basically join our team as a non-elite elite runner, if you will. Uh, if you've ever read the book Paper Lion by George Plimpton, George joined the Detroit Lions as a backup quarterback uh, during a, a, a training camp in the 60s and, and wrote a book about it. And that was sort of the impetus, as I understand it, for Matt's idea. Uh, he would come out to Flagstaff. He would be a part of our team. I would write him training like I do for all the athletes. And he would go to our strength and conditioning sessions. He would, um, you know, get massages from our massage therapist and eventually run the Chicago Marathon uh, at the end of all that in, in the fall of 2017, which he did, uh, and he ended up setting a, a lifetime personal best. And so the, 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 the story had a nice climax, but he did write a book about that called Running the, Running the Dream, and I, and I think it was very successful. And, and uh, so, so we got to know each other, obviously, very well during that time and, and remained friends, and he had always... He always let me know that he had an idea to write a book with me at some point and occasionally would would bring it up and eventually one one day just flat out asked to uh, get started on it and the result eventually was run like a pro even if you're slow that's amazing not only did you get a free a complete free training program <laughs> at a, a elite <laughs> level but you got a book out of it as well I got two books out of it I guess because you got the, uh, the running the dream out of it. And now this one. Yes, it was, it was actually quite early on in, um, in my time in Flagstaff. I spent 13 weeks on the ground there. And you know, I wanted the book that I wrote about that experience just to be pure narrative. I just wanted to tell the story. But I sensed that it, right, it, it, would, it would be mostly runners who read the book. Um, and you know, runners are very self-interested. Like usually if they pick up a running book, they want to learn something that they, they can use to improve. And there, there are like practical tips sort of like woven into the story I told and running the dream, but I knew it wouldn't really satisfy people who just wanted to also have something as close to my experience as possible. So my thought was, well, I could either cram that stuff into the narrative, which I thought would ruin it, or it could just be a separate book. So it, yeah, it was only... I'd only been in Flagstaff maybe a week and a half, two weeks when I started feeling bent out about uh, about possibly doing a you know a, a kind of sequel together. The other book, the first book where it sh it shares kind of your experience running with Hogan as Elite, is actually really good for selling the the ideas in the second book because you know basically you follow this training plan and you did all these things that are that you know that the pros do like uh, sleep more you know take naps uh, eat real food those kinds of things and you ended up running a lifetime personal best you know at the age of I think you were 46 46 I mean, that says something. And so now in this book, it's a little bit, I guess you're a little bit like giving away the recipe for that success. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, you know, because it is really a persuasive effort. I, I sort of assume a certain amount of skepticism on the part of the reader. It's like, I can't really do <laughs> what they do. And, and granted, I, I was always, I guess I was, you know, an above average runner going into it, but still what I, what I was able to accomplish by living the pro lifestyle blew away my own expectations. I mean, that marathon in Chicago, not only was I 46, but it was like my 40th marathon. And I hadn't PR'd in nine years. I hadn't come within nine minutes of my PR in nine years. So clearly it worked. And, you know, I am closer to a middle of the pack runner than I ever was to an elite runner. So, you know, that's, I, I think I am living proof that, hey, we're all human. Um, you have to scale things to your level. Um, but we all can do things the way the pros do and benefit from so doing. I mean, would it be fair to say that if you're a non-pro, that in fact you're better than you think you are and more capable of performing than you currently probably are because there are a whole bunch of these approaches or tools that you're not using effectively? I think so, certainly. You know, you have in many ways more ability to improve than the pros because the pros 
given their background or already at a very high level, they're already doing everything right. And, you know, they're consistently trying to tweak things and, and, and make little percentage point changes. But if you're someone who, you know, let's say hasn't been concerned about nutrition, that hasn't been a, a part of your uh, running regimen. If you haven't been thinking about or structuring your sleep patterns, if you haven't been thinking about things like activating before your run to make sure that you're maximizing each and every run that you do, uh, if you haven't thought much about recovery and what to eat after a run, how to treat your muscles and tendons and ligaments after a run, you start adding those things up and there's giant, uh, there's giant room for improvement. Improvement. And I think when you read the book, you realize that very fact that, oh, yeah, I haven't been doing this. I, I would find it hard to believe that anyone read, read the book and, 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 and just check every box and say, well, yeah. I already do that. I already do that. I already do that. I already do that. Already do that. Um, and, and uh, you know, so I, I think, of course, yes, I, the answer to your question is yes. I, I think uh, non-professional athletes have a tremendous amount of room for, for improvement. And I don't know if you have an answer to this really, but why do you think that recreational runners do so many things almost opposite of what uh, the elites do? I mean, you just think of like food and the elites, I mean, they, they eat lots of carbs. It's been written in, in several books, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, non-elites, they decide to try the keto diet. Why do you think that non-elites do everything different? It's a number of different factors. And then the, uh, in you know, chapter one of the book, I kind of go through a laundry list of them. One of them is that most, you know, unlike a lot of other sports, like fan-based sports, uh, most recreational runners don't pay all that much attention to the pros. And so they don't even know what they're doing. And so like, how are you supposed to emulate them if you're not even aware? Uh, another part of it is that, you know, like just social factors. Like if you're, you know, a four hour marathoner, you probably train with other four hour marathoners. So you just kind of end up doing what they're doing and what they're doing is not what the pros are doing. So it just kind of reinforces itself. And then the one that really, that I tried to, to address in the first book, a lot of uh, recreation runners don't feel like they deserve to do things the way the pros do. It's like, why should I bother getting massage or, you know, hiring a strength coach, you know, I'm only a four hour marathoner and I hate that, you know, it's just like, it's not that you should feel obligated to do these things, but you should, you should feel that you have the right to, you know, no matter, no matter how slow you are, hence the parenthetical part of our title, even if you're slow, <laughs> this is for you too. Is there, is there a, an aspect with, uh, with pro runners of, of secretism? I, I think, I think back to, um, you know, the story that we, that we covered, uh, about Nike and the Salazar debacle with his um, training camp and the amount of secrecy that there was around that. And the idea being that if the other teams find out what you're doing, then they have a chance to copy you. You're not going to have your athletes winning Olympic medals. Has Historically, has there been an aspect of that that has actually impeded um, your average Joe from being able to see what's going on? I think there's always been athletes and coaches that have been secretive, but there's also always been athletes and coaches that have not been secretive. So I don't know that that's been a determining factor in, in the, the disconnect between the pro and the, and the amateur. I tend to think it's more what, what Matt had to say uh, in, in his three bullet points there. And, and I certainly agree with his last point that there's this strange um, almost self-deprecating behavior <laughs> where the the amateur runner doesn't think that they deserve this or deserve that anecdotally when i used to own the running stores in st louis it was so hard to sell racing flats because the 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 four-hour marathoner didn't think that they should get those oh those are for fast mm -hmm. people and, and i said no 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 <laughs> they're for people to run faster there's no, there's no, you know, we don't have a little sign up there that you can only buy these if you run under 230. Um, but it is, it's a little bit of a battle to get people beyond that. I do think uh, things are improving though. And I think that ho hopefully teams like, like ours and, and other athletes and coaches out there are doing a better job these days, particularly through social media of sharing. And when they do so, amateur runners are more apt to follow them and to begin to learn from them. And hopefully things are heading in the right direction on that front. Yeah, I mean, just to be fair, I think I, I should sort of state for the podcast record that um, 
part of the credo of um, Hoka Naz Elite and your team there, Ben, is, is to be open, to be sharing, to be visible, to be active on social media, to be able to follow uh, training training programs on by video of somebody on a bicycle following, following around and, um, and being very open um, and sharing. So, um, you know, having said, talked about secretiveness that in no way, no way applies to Hoka Northern Arizona elite. It's almost the converse. It's built into their mission statement to be open. Yeah, for sure. Uh, exactly right. And, you know, it's just our feeling that, especially being in the pro world, I really don't think the training is all that different among the different groups. You know, you're doing mile repeats, you're doing long runs, you're doing long intervals. Uh, you're trying to find your sweet spot in terms of mileage, which we talk about in the book. And that's really what everybody's supposed to be doing. Uh, and, and of course, as Matt said at the very top, when you when you talk about learning from the pros and, and the actual workouts that they do, you, you're just trying to do scale. I mean, that's our suggestion is, is, is we're just trying to say that, hey, you can do these workouts. You're just doing scaled down versions of them uh, appropriate for you. So a little bit on that topic, one of the things in the book uh, you mentioned is that we should actually be running mostly a little bit less than we think we're capable of, which is kind of the opposite of what most people do, I think, myself included, after having spent like the whole summer being completely destroyed after these marathon workouts that I was doing. But I was like, hey, no pain, no gain. Um, so what, why would we want to do just a little bit less than what we think we're capable of? Yeah, it's, I mean, you can run a, a lot relative to your limits. Um, but the sweet spot is different for each runner. And the, you know, the way I define it is, yeah, it's one step back from the edge because there's a point of the, of diminishing returns. Like if you go from running 10 miles a week to 20, you're going to improve quite a bit more than if you go from 70 to 80. So the risk doesn't decrease. You know, there's a certain amount of risk in increasing your mileage, but the but the reward does decrease. So you eventually, when you get close to your personal limit, you're getting very little reward with a lot of risk. Um, so you just want to stay one step back from that edge. I, I honestly think like if if you've never gotten injured, you you keep trying, <laughs> keep going. Like that's how you find your limit. It's not the, it's not the end of the world. You know, if you, if you develop a you know a little bout of plantar fasciitis or whatever, I'm not telling people to go out and get injured, but, um, <laughs> but you want it, you sort of like, there, there's almost no other way to know where your limit is. Um, and then once you found it, you know, you're, you're not trying to lower the bar. I mean, if you, if you, if you love PRs, you have to bake in a certain amount of risk. But um, you just want to find that sweet spot where you're very, very likely to be able to get through each training cycle healthy, but you're also able to achieve the goals you set for yourself. Liz, are you, are you also asking from an effort level perspective? Yeah, maybe from an effort level perspective, because I, I mean, so I'll, I'll tell you how I felt during marathon training. Alan seemed to absorb it very well. Uh, me, not so much. So we followed the plan. Yeah, I think, I think you did better with that, Alan. Um, we followed the plan in the, uh, advanced marathon third edition. And, uh, so there were a lot of those medium long runs and there were several of them in the middle that I was just completely destroyed. And I was actually injured during the cycle. So at one point I was only like running every second day. So I got like Achilles, Achilles injury and all, all um, those so-called easy runs were what about, were about not, 10 percent back from your race pace yeah they were yeah. called like medium long runs or they were called easy aerobic it was very rarely written easy run so but, but, but the trouble with the trouble with you know backing off from your your race pace is we already have decided that our race pace was going to be a kick up from where we currently were so we end up running back from that at a speed that is normally our fast, I guess, fast training speed, um, because we want the, we want the extra improvement. So we're taking the race pace to be three hour marathon. We've never done one and then we're backing mm -hmm. it off and then we're finding it tough. Yeah. We, we were saying yeah. all the way through, uh, this training program is going to make us or break us. <laughs> I think it, it made you, but it broke me because Alan, Alan oh, no. managed to run some, um, there were a couple runs at marathon with marathon pace. So they were like long runs with some marathon pace in it. And, uh, he managed to do the one that had 16 K marathon pace within the long run. And I think I might've done 
it started at 13 K marathon pace. And I think I was not able to do any marathon pace in any of them. Like the one that there was one with 23 K at marathon pace. And after 10, I was toast. Um, and I think I, I practically had to walk back to the car at that point. I was completely toast, uh, but it was also in a generally like hard week. And so it just seemed like it kind of accumulated and I never recovered from it. Whereas Alan, he had some really good runs. Yeah, like I, some think of- we, I think we both felt that we left some of our performance on race day behind us on the training. Yeah. So how do we avoid that? Yeah. A co- co- couple of things there. I think Alan was certainly right to say that part of it is in your goal setting from the outset. My belief is that too many people 20 weeks out from their race pick an arbitrary time that, and I say arbitrary because they they make it up based on it sounds sexy to them or it's a BQ qualifying time. And they they don't, um, they don't come up with it based on data. They come up with it based on other factors. And first of all, we don't know if you're really going to be in that good of shape. Um, Second of all, what you really should be doing is honestly assessing the shape that you're in right then and there. And if you don't, let's say the time is 310 for the marathon. If you don't think you could run 310 for the marathon right there, you think you're more in 330 shape, then you should be doing the workouts, all the workouts based on 330. And if those become easy, then you start doing the workouts based on 320. And maybe by the end, you're doing them based on 310. I think actually in running the dream, I know Matt knows this. We really didn't do hard. We did, we did hardly any workouts or I didn't prescribe workouts based on what you ended up running. I prescribed them what I really based it on what the last marathon you had done was because that's kind of the shape we knew you were in. And then you slowly improved throughout the segment. So you're, you're giving yourself time to improve. And then on race day, you're making your race plan based on what you've done over the last few weeks of training. You're not stubbornly sticking to some time that you picked out 20 weeks ago. You're saying, hey, over the last four to five weeks, I've done this, this, and this. The data suggests that I can do this for the marathon. And now that's my goal. You know, Liz, hearing you say that you couldn't hit marathon pace, I suspect it was too fast um, because Hmm. marathon pace really should not be that. It's not really that fast of a pace, even for pros, even for pros, you know, and from a percentage standpoint, they're closer to their, their max when they're running a marathon. But, uh, but even for them, marathon pace is pretty easy for a number of miles. So yeah, I think there were maybe a few mistakes that you were describing there. And then the other thing, when you talked about no pain, no gain is, what pros do really well, and we talk about this in pacing and in other sections, is they master running fast and relaxed. But you can only master running fast and relaxed at proper paces. Because if you're trying to run marathon pace, but it's too aggressive, then it's you're in the wrong zone. If you're trying to run 10K pace, but you're doing it at too aggressive of a, of a pace, it, it, it's, it's the wrong zone. And you're working too hard and you can't be relaxed. And if you look at pros, they're so relaxed, even when running fast. Well, that's because they practiced it. And I think we've got to practice that as amateurs as well. And we've got to be really honest with ourselves about what those times need to be in training. Okay. Okay. So I guess like, let's say I'm building my strategy for next fall. I have run a three, three Oh four 30. So that means that I could probably train at 304 30 to start and then see if i can get to three hours so that would be the better that would be much much better and then how (laughs) but how would i know that that i'm ready to increase my paces because you know you can have good weeks and bad weeks and like for me i struggle with that because sometimes i'll have a, a fantastic training week and uh two weeks go by and i yeah i'm completely destroyed one week and i i never really know that's why i like following a plan because i figure the plan takes care of the the progression so you know those plans are you know they're made to progress the right way and have the right amount of fast running and slow running so i figure that takes out that variable i don't have to think about it um but then yeah obviously we're still learning <laughs> liz is an obsessive plan follower this is this is this is music to a coach's ear. Oh, is that right? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, of course, we want <laughs> you to follow the plan. Well, you got to make sure the easy days are easy too. So, so sometimes those bad weeks come as a result of getting too carried away on the easy run days, and you got to make those so easy. 
That's another thing about the pros. Matt, I'll let you jump in, but I bet people would be surprised to know how slow the pros run on their easy days. Am I right there? Yes, for sure. I mean, when I first arrived in Flagstaff, um, you know, I, I, I wasn't just going to put myself through the meat grinder like like you and I. It wasn't just like, let's see how quickly we can destroy Matt. Uh, <laughs> like it, it's like we, we wanted me to su succeed. And part of that meant I couldn't just go run with the pros like I was not I had no business running with them. However, you know, I, I, I had only been there a short time before. So initially in the easy runs, I was just off the back and, and Ben, bless his heart, would keep me company sometimes. Um, but after a few weeks, I was able to do some of the easy runs with the women on the team. And it wasn't because I was as fast as they were yet. Like I wasn't going to run a marathon as fast as they did, but because they were running their easy runs so slow, you know, relative to, to their ability. So, and then actually by the time, by the end of it, I was able to do some of the easy runs with the men on the team. And, you know, I went to Chicago with, uh, with one, one member of the team who ran, who ended up running 213. Well, I did not run 213, but I was doing easy runs with him a few weeks before Chicago. So yes, relative to their abilities. And it's like, if it's good enough for them, it should be good, good enough for us, but you have to, it takes discipline and restraint. You know, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're just training on your own or, or with, you know, a club members in, in Montreal on a random Wednesday, you got to hold yourself back. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. not, it's not easy as you say, because, um, I recall uh, a number of excerpts from the book where uh, Ben was saying, oh, you're going too fast once, once you got used to it a bit more and actually running you back because, you know, you've got the wild stallion kicking uh, suddenly and uh, you go, oh, I can go quicker than this. Yeah, but should you be going quicker than that? And that's, that's, the, that's the difficulty, I think, for, 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 your, for your, average, your average runner. The implication, though, is that if we could discipline ourselves to run correctly easy that's so we can keep our energy for the other 20 percent to do the really challenging stuff or is it challenging so what what do we how fast should the fast 20 percent be i guess is the question well the the 80 20 uh question is a good one for matt i'll, I'll jump in too but matt matt what you know when you talk about 80 20 and you're talking about that 20 percent even within that 20 percent i'm to understand it's not it's not all as fast as we can go throw up in the trash can afterward. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. So, you know, the 80, 20 rule is 80% uh, of your training should be at low intensity, like a physiological low intensity and 20% goes into the moderate and high intensity bucket. So it's like, it's the 20 is two different buckets kind of lumped together and how much of the 20 goes into the moderate bucket versus the high intensity bucket depends a little bit on where you are in your training and also what you're training for. One of the things that was different, like I said, I'd, I'd run like 40 marathons before Ben got his hands on me. And one of the things that was definitely different about the way he trained me for a marathon is that there was more stuff in the moderate bucket. And he explained like, this is, I think too many of like runners at your level go out and hammer, you know, six times a mile at 10 K pace and think that's going to lead to a great marathon. And, um, we didn't do too much of that kind of stuff. We, we definitely did. I mean, I was doing 200 meter sprints, uh, but that was just, you know, a sprinkling on top. Um, uh, but a lot of sustained stuff at moderate intensity. And I just gobbled it up. Like, you know, it just like, I, I have never, I did about as much volume as I'd ever done. You know, even at 46, I was running, I peaked at close to 90 miles uh, in a week, but I, I felt great all the way through. I, I remember um, do, sitting down for a podcast at one point when I was there, it was a college runner interviewing me and um, he, he wanted to trade places with me so badly. It was so obvious, <laughs> but, but his first question was like, God, the training, you're training with the pros. Like, it must be so hard. I'm like, you know what? Not really. <laughs> like, I feel great all the time. Like, you know, I, I, I do, I went into the pain cave in certain workouts, but um, I think that's another mistake that a lot of runners make is, is that they think like they're only doing it right. If, they're dragging through, you know, the peak weeks of training and, you know, there's a time and a place for that, but it's really minimal. Like you actually should be feeling pretty darn good most of the time. And that comes from, you know, setting appropriate paces, balancing things, right. And also listening to your body and, and knowing when to back off a little bit. And unfortunately for me, I just had, I had someone else making me back off <laughs> a little bit and I benefited. Yeah. And I'll just add that, um, you know, look, I get it that we want to challenge 
all of us. That's why we're doing it. If it, if it was easy, we it, we wouldn't consider it um, a goal. It, it really wouldn't appeal to us. It appeals to us because of the challenge. And so we want these workouts to be a challenge. But I would I would I would say this: there's more than one way to make a workout challenging. The traditional way that people think is they think of that pain that. Oh, my legs are tired. My stomach is churning. I'm getting a headache. I'm running so fast. <laughs> you know what, what Matt's talking about with really fast mile repeats or really fast 400s, like you might remember doing from high school. But there's also a challenge in backing off the pace, but adding volume to the session. So let's say instead of a traditional 10 by 400 at mile pace, there's a challenge in that. And, and we know what that is. But as you as you transition into the marathon specifically, there's also a challenge in running 15 times one kilometer at a pace that's actually pretty moderate. But that's a big mental challenge throughout the workout. Early on, you have to hold yourself back, which is a challenge. In the middle of the workout, you have to overcome that feeling of, man, I'm only eight in and I have to do seven more. <laughs> so that's a challenge. And then late in the workout, when you're at 12, 13, 14, 15, it does get kind of heavy uh, because of the volume on your legs. And I would just say to people, hey, take on that challenge. Take on that challenge because it's hard. It's just hard in a different way. And Matt described perfectly what the result is, is you actually don't feel that bad afterward. <laughs> it's a lot easier <laughs> to recover from a moderate intensity workout with a fair amount of volume. It, than it is a, a shorter session with a lot of really high intensity. And I know that's counterintuitive, but I promise you 15 by a K at your one hour race pace, you will recover from that and be less sore than you would if you did 12 quarters all out promise. Okay. I guess we'll have to try that. And then what, what about, what about pacing? Like, like Matt, maybe you can kind of answer this one. Uh, but you know, by the end of all this training that you did, did you ever get to that place where, where you didn't need your GPS to know how fast you were going? And then what's, what's the benefit? Like, should we all kind of be at that space when we know what, what pace we're going? Yeah. Pacing is one of those topics you don't want to get me started on because I, I think it's so important. And I also just think it's fascinating uh, because it's really a democratizing element of the sport. Like you don't have to be genetically gifted to be really good at pacing. And I, I define pacing as the art of finding your limit. And that's really what you want to do in a race is you want to finish the race knowing you found your limit and no device can do that for you. No device will ever be able to do that for you because your, your limit is actually defined perceptually. Like it's an endurance. You're not running as fast as you can at any point. In a, well, you sure will better not be at any point in a marathon. You're holding back. Well, how much do you hold back? Only the only mastery of perception of effort and the art of pacing can do that. You know, you can, you can use, you know, calculators and, and data and stuff to set appropriate goals and, and to guide you along the way, but you're a different runner. Every single time you lace up your shoes, the weather's a little different, you know, the environment's a little different and it's on you to figure out what's your limit on that day. And so I, I, as a coach myself, I'm big on, uh, you know, training, and, and it, it's fun. Like it, you can gamify the training process by working on your pacing. So yeah, I make a lot of my, my over aggress over, over zealous pacing when I was with NAZ elite uh, in Flagstaff, but I was actually, I was a very experienced runner and very good at pacing uh, before I got there. What got me into trouble was that two things. One, I had never trained at high altitude before. And I had never been coached by someone like Ben before, like who was like, he was giving me, he was figuring me out, but I was also a moving target because I got so fit so fast. Like both of us were just like, I mean, I, I wasn't openly defiant. I, I didn't go into workout saying, I'm going to blow the doors off these numbers Ben gave me. <laughs> I was, tr I was trying to be good, but I just, I just like, I could run in what I consider the spirit of the workout and still run way too fast. So I, you know, it, it, I wasn't at all worried about being able to, to pace uh, Chicago appropriately, but, you know, uh, Ben knew exactly how fit I was. He gave me a good goal and I, I was a good boy. I think, you know, my, my, my pace was 605 per mile. I ran the first mile in 602 um, and I didn't speed up from there. I actually dialed back a little bit. Um, and, and yeah, so it's worth it for anyone just to take pacing seriously 
and um, and just you know, it, it takes a while. It doesn't happen overnight. But you know, your your Garmin can't do it for you. You know, you can do it for yourself. And yeah, it, it'll if you want to if you want to be the best runner you can be, that is that is part of the formula. And to some extent, it's, there's a mental aspect that comes into play because your your brain's going to work against you. Uh, uh, I guess towards the end of it, um, there's the the primordial part of your brain that says, uh, "No, you have to save some energy for the saber tooth tiger that could jump out and attack you." <laughs> um, exactly. <laughs> And it's turning you off from a pace that you can actually maintain. This is what we're sort of hearing in the in the chapter, Pace, pace Like a Pro. I'll jump in because um, I know that we talk about this in the book. We talk about the fact that the brain is an amazing machine. It, it, it really has one job above all else, and that's to protect it, protect you, protect your body. And so it knows as you get laid into a, a long race, that if you keep doing this, you're eventually going to have some serious problems because it doesn't <laughs> know that you're going to stop at 26 miles. For all it knows, you're going for 100 miles. And so it's starting to tell you as you get into mile 17, 18, 19, hey, it's, start, it's starting to send you pain signals because it wants you to slow down. What you have to do is override those signals in that situation and pick up the effort just to keep the pace the same. Uh, now, going back to training for a second, how are you going to do that unless you've done those kind of workouts in training? That's why those high volume, um, moderate intensity workouts are so incredibly valuable in training because it is literal practice for race day. It's the same reason basketball players do layup after layup after layup after layup so that in the game, when they get a breakaway and they have a layup, it's second nature. Well, 19, 20 miles in, it needs to be second nature for you to override those signals, understand the effort level that you need to get to, to keep your pace the same as you enter the most difficult part of the race. Um, that's the best way to explain it, at least uh, the best way I can. There are some tactics as well that you mentioned called bracing and de de detachment. Yes. Can, you, can you explain that to us? Yeah, bracing is, um, psychologists call it defensive pessimism. When uh, the, the analogy I always give, and I, I, I have a dentist who said it doesn't work anymore because the painkillers are too good. But like in the old days when you were going in for a root canal and like you knew it was going to hurt. And there's actually science showing this. Like if you, if you go into an experience that you know is going to be painful, saying this is going to hurt, I'm just going to have to ride it out you'll actually be able to tolerate the pain better than if you go in with a kind of wishful thinking, just like, oh, I hope it doesn't hurt this time, even though you have every reason to believe it's going to hurt. And racing is very much like that. Like if you're doing it right, it's really going to hurt <laughs> at some point. Um, and so it's best just to embrace it. And you know, you don't try and turn yourself into a masochist, but you just, you, you understand that that is what you signed up for. And it really helps a lot because then no matter how much it sucks, you know, and, you know, three quarters of the way through the race, it at least doesn't suck more than you thought it would. Um, and you can just, you can tolerate it. And I guess detachment is the reverse, ignoring rather than embracing. Yes. Don't do that. <laughs> Okay, so I guess we can um, move on to another topic that um, that non elites uh, don't like, which is uh, doing all those, you know, those form drills, uh, pre warm ups, those kinds of things. So, you know, you mentioned two things in the book, one of them is uh, that there is no real one perfect running form. And then you also mention that all the elites do these drills to work on their running form. So, so which one is it? <laughs> yeah, those things are not, the, the, both of those things can be true, right? Because what you're trying to do when you're, when you're doing these form drills is you're trying to be as efficient as you can be. You're not necessarily trying to change your form. You're trying to maybe at best tweak it. But, but the real thing that you're trying to do is find your highest level of efficiency possible. And we all have that. We all have a, a ceiling that we can get to in terms of our own efficiency. Now, will it be as efficient as the, the most efficient runners uh, of all time or, or the best professionals uh, currently running in the world? No, probably not. But it certainly can be more efficient. And, and that's what we're really trying to do. And, and actually, as we talked about at the very top of this podcast, the, the amateur probably has more room to improve 
um, in, in terms of their form than the pro. The pro has maybe more reason to work on it uh, financially, but the amateur has more room to improve. Uh, there's a reason these people are pros, and one of them is they are pretty inherently efficient already. Uh, but an amateur, especially one who started later in life, you know, they've got a long way to go and, and just simple things like learning how to keep your shoulders relaxed, learning how to keep your face relaxed, learning how to run with a certain amount of coordination. These things can be achieved. I'm not going to say easily, but you'd be surprised how quickly you can get better at form drills. We saw that with Matt when he was in Flagstaff. And, and I do think those things really matter. Do you need somebody to look to be looking at you and saying, hey, you're doing your drill wrong? I think it helps. Matt, yeah. Matt did that help you? <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's one of my, my favorite scenes in the book. Uh, did he beat uh, you, Matt? Did he beat you with a stick or? He didn't have to. He, he okay. just, he had to, he had to suppress laughter is what he did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't entirely successful, but you know, the thing he told me after, after that first drill session and, and I showed up late, I got lost on the way to where the, the team was doing the drills. So when I showed up, the, the the pros were all gone. And so it was all eyes <laughs> on me. And, you know, I hadn't been doing mm. drills. Um, and so I made a complete hash of every single one of them. And Ben told me like the pros themselves, like most of them, if they came from a college program where they didn't do this kind of stuff, they look just as bad as you, <laughs> what, you know, the first time they, they did them, you will get better. Just like, just focus on the process don't you know compare yourself to the person on your left and the person on your right um, and it's true you know there's a there's a only a tiny bit of footage a video for me when I ran the Chicago Marathon at the end of it and it's from uh, I think Jen took it right uh, your wife yeah, I think on Michigan Avenue maybe mile yeah, 25 yeah yeah 25 and and you know I'm one of those runners who you know when I'm having a good race I feel like I look like a pro and then I see the video mm. and I'm like oh dear god <laughs> yeah. but but there you know I, I'm only one mile from the finish line of a marathon and I you know, I didn't look like a pro but I looked better running than I've ever seen so my form definitely did evolve in those 13 weeks but not once did Ben or anyone else ever say oh you're running wrong you need to do this it wasn't like it's not like batting practice where you consciously manipulate uh, the way you run. You just do, you do drills. You run a lot. You run at different speeds. You strength train. You do mobility work. All those things together will cause your form to evolve without your ever having to consciously think about it. And is there a reason why you would do the form drills like before the run instead of after the run or separately from the run? Like, is there any benefit? I mean, I guess if doing them is step number one, but let's say now you want to optimize when you do them. Yeah, I think there's two times to do them. I think doing them after an easy run that is that is occurring the day before a hard workout. Number one, you're the farthest removed from the previous hard workout. So you're the freshest, which allows you to do the work, the, the form drills to, to their maximum. You're, you're more likely to do them well when, you're, when your muscles are fresh and poppy and have some spring to them. Number two, those drills then loosen the body up for the next day's workout. So there's, there's value in that. And then the next best time to do them or the, or the second time I recommend doing them is the very next day before the workout itself. Once again, your body is fresh. You have adrenaline. You're prepared to do these kind of springy drills and they loosen the body up for the workout that's about to start. I like the harder, more intense, more voluminous version of the drills to be that day before version. And then I like a shorter scaled down version of those drills to loosen up for the workout. I don't want to take anything away from the workout right beforehand. In exercises as well, something that came, comes up in the book that I don't think I've seen before, you talk about corrective exercises. Sounds, sounds very um, prison campish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're funny. giving you corrective exercises, yeah, Matt. I know. Um, what, are, what, are, what are they? It is a controversial term. I can't remember where I learned it from, but there are some you know, physios who, who don't like it. it. Sounds punitive, but it's just, it's just sort of a catch-all term for exercises that you do to keep your body balanced. So I think, you know, um, most that are, that are customized for you in particular, according it, 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 to exactly. maybe, you know, yep. problems that you have or things you've identified in your style or yeah. 
Okay. Yep. Yeah, so it's a grab bag of, um, you know, strength movements, usually for like, you know, smaller muscles like your feet and, um, you know, some of the stabilizing muscles in your hip or whatever. And also like, mo you know, mobility movements that can involve like anything from foam rolling to, you know, to stuff with bands or whatever. And so, you know, all the pros that I train with would, would strength, do two full body strength workouts, uh, you know, per week usually. But separate from that would be these little corrective exercise, corrective exercise sessions, which would be like every day. And, and because I was constantly on the verge of breaking down during my time there, I was collecting more and more. I was, I was into, uh, <laughs> I was into hypo two sport to see, uh, the Greg brothers almost daily. And they would say, Oh, you're going to have to add this to your regimen. So actually I ended up timing it toward the end of my time there. And it blew it ballooned up to like 33 minutes. And that, this was every day, but Hey, I was there to train like a pro. So and it's one of those things that anything is better than nothing. So if you're like, oh my goodness, I barely have time for my runs. How am I going to find time for corrective exercise? But A, you can, it's, it's a nice way. I would do them in the morning. Just, it's like a nice day to show, sort of like ease into the day after you've had your, your coffee, but it doesn't have to be 33 minutes. Like honestly, anything is better than nothing. So if you've ever been injured, if you've ever gone to a physio for an injury, they've probably given you little things to do. And it's just a matter of like kind of holding on to those things and making it like a little bit of, of a routine. And, you know, you don't, you don't even have, you don't even have to change out of your, you don't have to get into workout clothes necessarily to do them. You don't work up a sweat. You don't have to shower afterwards. So most runners can find a way to fit some type of corrective exercise into your routine, into their routine. And I will say it wasn't all, it wasn't all one thing, but, you know, I was 46 years old when I went through this experiment. And quite honestly, I felt like I was aging in reverse during those 13 weeks. I just felt younger and younger and, and more athletic, um, just more. I felt like I could dunk a basketball. I didn't try, but like it was just it was wonderful. I, just, I, was, I think it was just it was all of these little things. It wasn't the running that was making me feel like I was aging in reverse. It was the, the stuff surrounding it. Wow. So I guess that means that uh, that our coach, Bill, uh, when he gets his uh, his exercises for his hip flexors, and then he stops doing them after his hip flexors feel better, uh, he should just keep on doing those then. And then next time, he, when he gets new exercises, he just adds them on. And so you keep on piling them up. Is that kind of how, how it went with you? Yes. Or, or they can also evolve, you know, so you might have, you know, for the first time in your life, you get, you know, a knee injury, whereas it was always in your hips or your feet before. So then, you know, you, you might learn a new exercise or two to help address whatever factors contributed to that injury. And those might displace some things that you've been doing forever, but maybe you don't need as much anymore. Cause that's the thing, like these things, they change your body. Like if you mm -hmm. do the mobility stuff, you become more mobile. Um, you know, if you strengthen, you know, uh, little muscles that are neglected by running and they get stronger, well, you, you, your body has, has changed. So your, your routine, your, your routine, and you also, you age, right? Um, so, and also I should say that most runners have some, some common issues. So if you don't know where to start, you can start, you can grab a, like uh, Jay DeSherry's running rewired book and just pluck some stuff out of there that like are issues for almost every runner start there and then, and then evolve your routine as time goes on. So there's a whole chapter dedicated to um, uh, stress management. And, um, you know, I always kind of thought, well, I have the perfect job to be a runner because I have an office job. I just kind of go to work. I sit in front of a computer and I do my work and then I'm, my body should be super fresh to run. So like no issue there. Is that right? Or, or does it affect my running anyway? Everything affects your running, you know, stress, <laughs> stress is um, an interesting word because I think we associate it with negative stress. I think that's what we think of, but, but actually, you know, there's positive things that go on your, in your life that, that cause stress too. I mean, there, there's people that absolutely love their job and spend eight hours banging away at work and loving every minute of it, but that's still stressful. That's, uh, you know, same thing with family. I mean, it's great to spend time with family, uh, but, but it's, it, it can be stressful even if it's positive. And so I think, um, my, one of one of my old coaches, uh, Greg McMillan, used to used to call it the the stress pie. You know, you, you need to think of it as an overall pie, and running is a part of that. Life is a part of that. You know, your job, your family, all, all these little things are a part of it, and and you have to factor those things in. You know, you talked uh, earlier in the pod about 
having good weeks and bad weeks. And I think as runners, we're, we're, we're constantly trying to blame the running on those ups and downs. And we're mm-hmm. never factoring in the outside stressors. And oftentimes it's the outside stressors that are causing those ebbs and flows a whole lot more uh, than the actual running. Okay. Well, I guess it's something to think about. And if there's a, <laughs> if there's a pie, You don't sound like you believe me. <laughs> no, very, very dismissive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> As someone who knows her, it sounds like she's considering quitting her work to improve her running. <laughs> she you, believes you, know, you sorry, guys too much. I mean, you know, here's the thing. Here's the thing is what you have to do is you just have to be honest. And you have to say to yourself sometimes, hey, I'm really stressed positively or negatively from work or a relationship. And I need to scale something back somewhere. And maybe it is the running. That's okay. Um, because it's not. <laughs> it is okay because in the end, the, 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 the next week's run will be better. Um, if you're smart about those things, you would never, you would never strain your Achilles and, and act as if you should go out and do the exact same run you had planned. Uh, or I hope you wouldn't do that. Uh, and no. yet, you know, we, we break up with the significant other and spend all night, uh, up, uh, without sleeping. And, and then we, we want to go out and run our 20 because our 20 miler is on the schedule. Um, but that strained Achilles and that maybe you want to run it as treat as treatment. So. Yeah, that's strained. Well, that's true too, but, but that strained Achilles and that breakup have some similarities uh, because they were both, uh, they both negatively affect the body and uh, it's just a balance and it's just about being uh, honest with yourself, I think. So, so you're saying the stress pie that you referred to is, is a single pie for physical stress and mental stress. It's all, it's all the there. same pie. It's all the same pie. That's going to be hard to keep track of. Try to make your life as simple as possible. Right. <laughs> I've suddenly got a whole new series of excuses for my workouts. <laughs> <laughs> Liz is going to go, oh, you didn't quite keep up. I said, well, you know, my Amazon <laughs> delivery didn't come this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. If that's the biggest stress in your life, I want your life. <laughs> you, you probably do i mean it's it's interest interestingly you know i had a job as a as i explained to you before we started recording I had a job as a as an executive um in the pharmaceutical industry and i was working a lot of hours and they're they're big decisions you know they're one they're they're, they're million dollar decisions that we're talking about and money for me was never a stressor because you know it is what it is and it's somebody else's money, but in pharmaceuticals, it's often people's lives. Okay, we've got a quality issue here. What sort of quality issue is it? Are we going to put this drug out? People need this drug. Is it going to have anything wrong with it? If we don't put it out, people are not going to get the drug when they're supposed to. Those things start to get stressful because the rules are very, very, very draconian and very restrictive and, and maybe suggest that you shouldn't be giving drugs out that are almost perfect. Uh, um, to people who need it. And you go, well, I'll give it to my children. I give it to my granddad. And there are people there who need it to be treated. And they're going to have more negative effect through not getting the drug. And we saw that dilemma with COVID and vaccinations and vaccines of being made available. And suddenly I retired and didn't have any of that. But I had a running program and I was able to, I think, have a bigger piece of pie to put my running stress into. Mm-hmm. And maybe sure. that explains a little bit how I was able to improve. I joke with the athletes I coach that I, I secretly want them all to quit their jobs or retire. <laughs> there you go, Liz. Hmm, I'm going to have to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> could be a road to three hours at the end of the year. Uh, I could be. It could be. And I really want that sub three hour. I, I, I just want to see two as the first number. And then, you know, oh, it feels so good. Are. It feels so good. You know, for me uh, in running the dream, I talk about like my, my white whale was sub 240 and I, I had been chasing that goal forever <laughs> and, and I, I had given up on it. I thought my, my time had passed me by. I'm spoiling the uh, spoiler alert for those who haven't read running the dream. But you know, when I, when I achieved that goal, oh my goodness, it felt so good i mean just because it was so long in coming so that's how your sub three is going to feel for you liz uh when you yes get there. yeah i think so because i've been chasing this goal since uh 20 
I did Boston in 2011. That was the first time that I was going to train for this sub three hour. And the reason I decided sub three hour was not even me. It was my coach at the time. And it was because the year before I had qualified with like a 314, but I didn't do any marathon training. I, I basically did 5k training with um, long runs on the weekend. And then I ran like a 314 and it was like, it just came out of nowhere. And so he thought, well, with such a big improvement, because previously I had run like close to four hours, I think 350 was my time before that. And he said, well, there's no reason why you can't go down to three hours. This time we're actually going to do marathon training. And ever since then, I never got the three hours and um, I still don't have that sub three hour marathon. And that was 2011 and we're 2022 now. So <laughs> it's been yeah. a long time. You can do it. You can do it. The last year or last two years, you've been tasting it, haven't you? Ah, uh, so close. Just so close. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and if, and if I don't have my Zimmer frame, I'm going to be chasing it right next to you. I <laughs> picked up my Zimmer frame by then. Um, can, can we talk a little bit about, about diet? I'm particularly hopeless at nutrition. I've been trying to improve there a little bit. You know, eating like a pro is one chapter in, in your book. Maybe you should just ask, is, you know, is there something that the pros do that maybe recreational runners don't do? Is there something specific or in particular? Plenty. You know, they don't do fad diets. And, you know, that's one of the things that uh, when you asked at the outset, like, you know, why don't the, why doesn't the average runner or why don't recreational runners uh, do things like the pros? On the diet side, I think you know part of it is that I think it's easy to talk a lot of recreational runners into kind of harebrained measures because they're looking to make giant leaps. It's like you know if I'm you know if I'm way far away from where I want to end up uh, eventually, like I must need to do something radical, and so that's how you get people to like cut all the grains out of their diet or whatever. The pros like you know, they've been chipping away and chipping away and they're very, you know, they've already realized 99% of their genetic potential. So you're not going to talk them into doing something weird or offbeat, mm. you know, methodologically in training and in diet. And one of the cool things about my, you know, fake pro runner experience is that I, I lived with a member of the team, Matt Yano, who loved to cook and like was a foodie. And, you know, I, I'm, as you mentioned at the top, I'm a certified sports nutritionist. I've written books about diet. So I thought, well, that's one box I do have checked and there's no room for improvement. And like being under the same roof with Matt Yano just shamed me, you know, it's just like, okay, there's, <laughs> there actually, there actually is room for improvement. And, it, you know, and so, but Matt didn't, he wasn't on any type of diet with a name. He just, and, and the food that he made for himself and ate was delicious breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. He wasn't sacrificing anything. He ate a lot. Um, he, en he enjoyed his food, but it was just like a very high quality version of normal. <laughs> and that's all, that's all it takes. I, I lost nine pounds in the 13 weeks I was in, in Flagstaff and I showed up at, at what had been my racing weight forever. Um, I'm, I'm a natural ectomorph. I'm six feet, one inch, in height, I weighed 150 pounds when I showed up. I raced Chicago at 141 pounds, like which is just about yes. my high school weight. And I, I, I was not depriving myself. I wasn't skipping meals or counting macros or anything. Like I was just like copying Matt Yano. And yeah, I, I enjoyed my food. I ate plenty of it, but it was just very, very high quality consistently day after day after day. Nothing weird, nothing radical. Yeah, I, one of the things I really liked about writing this book is, um, and I hope people like uh, when they read it is is that matt really digs into the science during the chapter the bulk of the chapter and then i write these coaches tips at the end using more anecdotal evidence and and just storytelling really and the story i i tell in the nutrition chapter is about stephanie bruce who is an example of someone who does have to be very careful about her diet because of her particular restrictions due to having celiac disease and a, a mutated gene and, and, and different things. And so she, she's got to be really careful, but you know, what she did, I, I kind of take the reader through her nutrition journey over time. And essentially what she did was just find out what she can have. And I think that's the biggest difference. I think so many amateurs, so many people, when they're trying to lose the weight, they're, they're trying to eliminate things. They're trying to find out what should I not eat? And it's almost like the exact opposite. 
It should be, what can I eat? Food <laughs> is fuel, you know, stuff, stuff is looking for more things to eat. Um, and believe me, if you're like stuff and if you have celiac disease, you probably get pretty annoyed with these people that are trying to cut things out of it. <laughs> um, and that's sort of one of the reasons I used her as an example. We, we really should be looking for all the great things that we can eat and that we should be eating and we should be eating a lot of different things. And, and of course, Matt talks about this in detail in a scientific way uh, inside the pages of the book. But uh, that that's my thing is, is, you know, food is fuel and, and we should be enjoying it and eating a lot of it. Uh, it's, it's just, we, we, we want to, to eat good, normal food on a consistent basis. And, um, and I think people would be probably surprised, um, how, how much the, the pros eat and, and how, how little they, it's not how little they care. As Matt said, Matt Yano is a great example. He cares a lot, but you don't really have to think about it when you're just eating a normal, good diet. It doesn't have to be a stressor for you. It's actually something that's quite enjoyable. And you, you actually mentioned like racing weight and um, it, it kind of reminds me, you know, you, 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 everybody has the, the friend that is always trying to lose weight by dieting or 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 something like that. And, um, you know, in running in the running community, it's, it's a little bit of that as well. Is there a right way, I guess, to lose weight? Should runners even be looking to lose weight? Because, you know, you mentioned that you do need to fuel your training as well. Yeah. Here's how I look at it. I mean, we're fooling ourselves if we don't think that body weight and body composition, uh, affect distance running performance. They do. I mean, there's plenty of science there. I get annoyed with people who treat the topic as a kind of third rail. It's like, oh, we, we can't talk about that. Like, no, the truth is always worth talking about. And it's, it's no fair. I mean, I understand that like, you know, disordered eating and body dysmorphia and those serious issues are all too prevalent in the sport, but that's no reason that we have to deny the fact that, that optimizing your body weight and body composition can help you, you know, achieve a goal like running a three hour marathon. It's all a matter of like, you know, approaching it in, in a healthy way. And, you know, I've written quite a lot about this and I very much believe in don't set goals because you, that, that talk about, Ben talked about arbitrary, like, um, you know, race time goals. Well, any type of like weight goal, unless you've been there before and you know from experience that it's, it's where you are your healthiest and fittest, then you have no idea. So you need to focus on the process, like do things by the book, you know, and, and that is eating plenty. Like not eating enough is a way bigger performance detriment than eating too much as a runner. That's part of the fun. Uh, you don't want to eat way too much. I mean, you want to eat just the right amount, but you don't want to restrict yourself in terms of uh, how much you eat and also the variety of things you eat. So just stay focused on the process. It's okay to care. Uh, it's okay to want to, it, you know, that's exactly how I lost nine pounds in, in Flagstaff. I, I did not have a goal to lose any weight. I just, I just started doing things more by the book. Yeah. I was, I was running more, you know, it's, it's easy to fool yourself. Everyone looks through their, at, at their diet through rose colored glasses. And when I was just you know, in the kitchen with Matt Yano day after day after day, I'm like, oh, I do eat a lot of cheese. Don't I? <laughs> I was kind of kidding myself there. So you just, you know, you just clean up your act a little bit, um, take it a day at a time and see where you end up. And if, if you do focus on the process, wherever you end up is where you are supposed to be. Yeah, I, I remember um, in uh, Running the Dream, how you mentioned that he has like 26 ingredients in his salad. And I, I was just blown away by that because, <laughs> because I don't even think I have 10 and I'm really like impressed with my salad when I have, you know, <laughs> I have extra cucumbers to put in or something. So just develop good practices, basically, and good habits and eat everything, fresh that's stuff, right. good quality stuff. I think that's what, that's the take home message. Yes. Nothing sexy about it, but, yeah. but it's the fact. Okay. It's really boring. Yep. <laughs> boring, but it's, it's not easy to do. I think. No, uh, it's not. Yeah. It's not. Like I, I'm, I'm a chocolate bar addict. So I, I would have, I'd feed my, I would feed my um, addiction with one chocolate bar per day you know, like a, a Kit Kat or a Twix or something like that. And then um, my son-in-law is taking a nutrition course and, and he's a fitness coach and he's starting to get us to all look at what we're eating. So I've actually started reading the ingredients on things to see, okay, so where am I getting my 
where am I getting my uh, proteins from and where am I getting my carbs from and where am I getting my fats from at the end of the day, providing you're throwing in enough fruit and veg, you're getting all your, your, your vitamins and stuff. And like, it's, it's like reading a, a cigarette packet, reading these chocolate <laughs> bars. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> like I'm picking up some fresh stuff and looking at it and going, okay, there's like two grams of decent fat in that. And then you pick up a chocolate bar and there's like 15 grams or 20 grams of bad <laughs> fat in it. Like, oh my God, what am I doing with this in my diet? So that's, I don't know, maybe I'm going to have to wean off a little bit. <laughs> um, c- can we switch over to um, mindset a little bit? We all know that, you know, having confidence and having good confidence is, is key to performing and uh, we see the pros and they're wonderful. So of course they'd be super confident all the time. Maybe that's not really the case, but it, it appears reading your book that in fact, recreational runners or amateurs have more trouble with their confidence than, than pro runners. How, why is that? And what can we do about it? Yeah, I can start. I mean, I, I don't know that that's completely true. I, I, I would certainly say there are pros that struggle with confidence. And I would certainly say that there are amateurs that don't. Um, I don't know what the percentages are uh, in total, but um, you know, I, I think runners build confidence through a few different channels. One is just training over time. You build confidence in yourself through a pragmatic training program that graduates your fitness over time to the point where you're at your fittest on the biggest day. I think there's a lot of confidence to be gained along the way as you hit the workouts and hit the times that you're supposed to and you know, slowly, gradually build your mileage, slowly, gradually, gradually build your intensity over the course of a segment. I think there's confidence that comes from that. I think there's confidence that comes from those around you. If you have a good support team around you and it doesn't have to be a professional coach and a professional strength and conditioning expert and a professional nutritionist, it can be your running partners and your running club and your significant other. And those people are part of your support team. Uh, just just like the pros have some of these um, experts on, on their side, right? If those people believe in you, that gives you confidence. And, and I think it's a combination of those things and then just experiences over time. You, you, you learn how you perform when you're not confident. <laughs> you learn what you feel like on those kind of days. You try to eliminate those things that led to those non-confident days and those non-confident performances. And you try to focus on the things that you felt and the things that you did on days when you were really confident. And, and over time, you, you build sort of a um, checkbox list of what it takes for you to be confident going into a race. And it, it's a little bit different for, for everybody, but um, I, I think there, of course, are, are people that, you know, come into this sport a little more inherently confident, although, you know, look, we all have to learn that at some point, we're not confident as babies. You know, I, I saw a sports psych once uh, remind us that remind the audience that we were born um, screaming, crying and uh, peeing and pooping in our pants. Uh, so <laughs> we, we, we weren't born confident, you know, we built that somewhere along the way. Uh, something about how we grew up, something about those that influenced along the uh, influenced us along the way. So if you're a person who you struggle with confidence, just take take confidence in that fact that you know it can be built. Um, you know it. You know you can get to that point. Some people just have to work on it uh, a little more than others. Um, that was a bit long winded, but uh, my my big point there is that if you're a person who is is uh, is struggles with confidence, you you can get there. And, um, you know, you mentioned one of the ways to gain confidence is through your training. And uh, I'm one of those like I if I can hit workouts at race pace, then I feel confident going into a race. And when I can't hit race pace, I don't feel very confident. And apparently this is pretty typical for recreational runners. Apparently we uh, bad workouts affect us more than then they affect the pros because the pros also have bad workouts, but they don't seem to be affected as much. So why is that? Like, what, what do I need to change? One thing that I've noticed as someone, you know, I I'm uniquely positioned in that um, as a coach, I work with and almost exclusively, exclusively with recreational athletes, but uh, as a writer, I get to hobnob with folks like Ben and, and NAZ elite. So I'm able to make pretty broad comparisons. I mean, obviously there's 
lots of individual variation. But one thing I've noticed uh, that was very striking about NAZ Elite and other elite athletes um, I've been around is that they're, they, they're very rational. <laughs> I mean, they have emotions just like us, but they usually let reason call the shots. And one thing that is just a simple fact about training is that you cannot have a better workout than you're physically capable of. So it's actually your best workouts that prove how fit you are because you can't pull a great workout out of a hat. It has to come from your fitness. There's nowhere else for it to come from. It's your subpar workouts that don't tell you much about your fitness. I mean, if they're all subpar, that's a problem. But the mistake I see a lot of recreational runners make is that they live and die by whatever the last workout was. And they, you know, they could have a clunker of a workout and, and three days before that, they knocked one out of the park, but they forget that. And they forget the fact that it was actually the better workout that told them more about their fitness. You could have a clunker of a workout for any of a number of reasons, poor night's sleep. Sometimes it's just one of those days and you'll never know why uh, you laid an egg. So that's it, that is important to recognize because you, you can't lie to yourself like that. You, can't, you don't build confidence by lying to yourself. But if you just kind of keep reason in charge, you know, we all have self-doubt, but if you're able to just sort of, uh, I, I, ref, I have this, uh, I refer to it as your internal Spock, you know, Lieutenant Commander Spock from Star Trek. Like, you know, we, we all have a logical part of us um, and the pros are really good at tapping into that logical part of them when there's an important decision to be made or, or a lesson to be drawn from an experience. I guess what you're saying there, just listening to both of you talk, has just triggered something in my mind. What you're saying there is that the pros are, in fact, superb ultra realists Yes. versus us mere mortals. And if anybody wants to read further on that, they could actually get themselves a copy of Matt's last book, The Comeback Quotient, which in fact talks about the very good ultra realism, ultra realist approaches that pro athletes have. Checks, checks in the mail, Alan. Thank okay, you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As part of the mindset um, uh, chapter, you talk about a little bit about champions mindset, the, the mindset of champions. I don't know. I don't know whether we've, we've spoken about it effectively already in, in your, your answers to the last questions, but you know, what is the champions mindset and how do we may mortals get more of it? Yeah. To me, to me, uh, you know, that's, that's a phrase that, my high school coach uses a lot and that we used when we wrote a book together, the book you mentioned, maybe at the top there, Tradition Class Pride, which is about building a, a, a powerhouse high school cross country team. And he always looked for champions. And what he meant by that, and, and, and what I believe that a champion's mindset is, is it's, it's a person who actually loves the hardest parts of, of, of running. <laughs> they embrace the difficult parts of workouts. They embrace the difficult parts of, of racing. They enjoy competing. They relish being right with somebody with 800 meters to go, whereas a lot of people fear that. <laughs> there, there's a lot of runners, pros and, and recreational runners alike, that believe it or not, if you really watch what's going on, they'll purposefully fall back as they reach that part of the race, because they don't want that head to head battle deep down. They don't want that. They would rather come in by themselves <laughs> and uh, the champions relish it. They want it. They ask for it. And that mindset, though, I do believe, as I said a second ago, it, it, it can be learned. Um, it's not easy. You know, it's not easy to have that champion's mindset. And I think if you want to get it, you, you have to work at it. And it, it takes um, a tremendous amount of that ultra realism that, that Matt said, because you know what? The first step to becoming a champion, if you're not one, is admitting that you're not one <laughs> and, and, and recognizing your, your failures and recognizing that, hey, maybe I'm someone who gets too down after one bad workout. Champions don't do that. Maybe, maybe in my last race, I took a peek at my watch and realized that I was going to get the time I wanted, no matter how I ran this last mile. And I kind of shut it down. Champions don't do that. Champions go to the well and acknowledging those things about yourself uh, and then correcting them over time can, can make you a champion. But I, I've just always loved working with the champions. You know, I, I, we, we had a woman this past weekend at the Houston marathon, Alice Wright, who missed two years of running, did not run a race. Well, she didn't miss two years of running, but she missed two years of competing due to various illnesses, injuries, global pandemic, et cetera. 
She just came back this fall and raced the Athens half marathon first race in two years, won that race. Um, she did a little hour run on the track and set the British record a month later. But, but the big one was this Houston marathon. She, she'd been wanting to, to run a marathon for a long time. This was her debut. And the big time that she needed to hit was 229.30 because that's the world championship A standard. And she's running the race and she comes through 114.36 at halfway. So she's on pace and she's on pace at, at 25K, 30K, 35K. I'm sure she looked at her watch at 40K. She's not stupid. She knew she was going to go <laughs> under 229.30. But she had at 40K, she was 16 seconds behind second place. And instead of just cruising it in and knocking out her sub 229.30, she cranked that last mile and cranked and cranked and cranked and ended up passing the second place woman at the line and ran 229.08. Oh. That's a champion. That's a champion. You know, she didn't have to go that hard. And, uh, and she went to the absolute well and actually threw up uh, at the finish oh, line. No. But I was... I was so happy oh, yes. because I was so <laughs> happy because I just, I don't know how else to define what a champion is, but, yeah. but what I just described. I lived in Australia for, uh, for quite a few years and the Australians are fanatics at sport and like to excel. And, you know, one of the things they taught me in my little amateur soccer club, they used to say to me, Alan, never be afraid to win. <laughs> <laughs> because there are there are absolute winners at sport. Their culture is built around sport and and outdoors, and they're, they're world champions at so many sports that really they shouldn't for the size of the country. Because because their attitude is they breed they breed an attitude of that sort of mindset. The last section of the book is a whole bunch of training plans, and I noticed that at the beginning of each training plan, it says adaptive versions are available through the Pace app. So well, what's the Pace app? Because I saw that Kara Goucher is also now a coach with the Pace company or website or whatever it is. So maybe you guys can explain. Yes. Uh, so this is something that uh, I think maybe many people listening, some anyway, are familiar with the Training Peaks uh, platform. They've been around for 22 years now. And, you know, a lot of coaches use it to train athletes. I do. My company, 8020 Endurance, we all of our ready made, like, you know, pre built training plans for triathlon, running, obstacle racing are provided through that platform. Um, you know, artificial intelligence is the future. So there's more and more of these like apps and software platforms that are using, uh, creating uh, adaptive training plans. So it's not just like, you know, here's your 20 week plan. It like it's done. It's, it, you know, it's, it's not going to change. It's etched in stone. These are plans that are just sort of a little bit more customized to the individual and will change based on like if you miss a workout or if you have a bad workout or if you actually have a, a better than expected workout, the plan will evolve as you go. Uh, just it, it, it tries to recreate the decisions that a real human coach would make. And so that's what the, the Pace app is. It's they're sort of going for uh, the folks who currently are just self-coached or just get their plans out of magazines or what have you. And it's like a subscription thing. You just download the app onto your smartphone and it's like you get 30 days for free and then it's like five bucks a month. And you can just, one of the things that makes their, their offering different from a lot of the others out there is that they wanted to retain the human factor because they respect that um, you know, a lot of the magic of, of coaching is it's not the algorithms that go into building a plan. It's, it's that human touch, which Ben is just so brilliant at. Um, so I, I was one of five coaches that they brought in to create plans to launch with for the app. Greg McMillan is another one. Um, Amanda Brooks. Yes, exactly. Um, Cara Goucher. Yes, and uh, a gentleman named uh, Sid, Sid Baptiste and, uh, out of Boston is, is the fifth. And so, yeah, you just go in there, you choose a coach. Uh, you say what you're training for. You say like, hey, I prefer to do my long runs on Sunday and I prefer not to run on Monday, whatever. Uh, and then it creates a custom plan for you. And then you just you just follow it um, as you would any other plan. Uh, you can upload your workouts straight to the app and you know it, it, will, it, it will evolve over, over time. So the plans in the book, that's sort of, those would be your starting point. That's sort of like the cookie cutter version. So it, like they, if you followed one of the plans that's in the book, and then if you went and trained for a, a race of the same distance using me as your coach on the pace app, you would have a very similar experience, except that the app would actually, the plan would actually change as you go uh, to make sure that it's constantly meeting you where you are as any, as a, as any training process should. One of the things that I found really cool in the, in the training part of it is at the end of each section, 
be it 5k or 10k half marathon or whatever there's a little um sort of mini chapter or paragraph from from ben saying you know what's my favorite training program what i suggest for this and why so you get the real practical hands-on uh sort of insight i don't know if you can remember what you said for 10k i was thinking 10k would be a good a good thing to uh to, to have you tell us about Ben in terms of favorite training because 10k training works for everybody I, I think to some extent so it's nice sort of middle ground gosh what did I say I probably said k's you know <laughs> uh, one one k repeats are, are so phenomenal uh, for for all kinds of distances um, when, when I think about 10k uh, training and all the different things that go into it look I think you need to be really eclectic just like Matt was talking about earlier how we trained for the marathon. You still need to be sprinkling in speedy stuff. You still need to be doing long, you know, lactate threshold workouts like you might do for a half marathon or marathon. But I think, you know, given that you're doing all those things, I think running 10 by a K at your 10 K race pace is the ultimate 10 K workout really. Um, because a K is long enough that you're really feeling that sort of rhythm, but also that sort of pain that you're going to feel uh, in a 10k race uh, without going overboard you know sometimes us runners we want to know for sure that we can run the race it's like well at some point it's got to be a leap of faith you know you can't do a 9k time trial um, a week out from your 10k race I mean that, that is your 10k race you know you, <laughs> there's some sort of leap of faith but I think what kind of gaps would you have between the k's you know, I think if you're really uh, very, very aerobically fit, you could probably do it off a minute rest. Um, if you're um, maybe a little bit more toward the beginner side of things, you might need two to three minutes rest. Um, but the shorter, the better. <laughs> the shorter, the better, because uh, the more specific it makes the workout. You know, if you take five minutes rest between every K, that's just, you're not going to get that same kind of feeling. Your heart rate's going to go all the way back down and you're not going to get the, uh, the same sort of physiological stimulus necessary to, uh, to mimic the race, but yeah, just very simple 10 by a K at, at race pace. And then, um, you know, tack on a little speed at the end, maybe, um, four times 200 or four times 300. I think something like that would be a great, a great 10 K workout. That sounds, that sounds like a bonkers workout to me. Oh no, it sounds <laughs> much better to me because Bill was having us do three times three K at 10 K pace. Was, Those yeah. absolutely right, demolished me. And he was doing that like every month. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know what I like uh, for three by three K or three by two miles. If, if you're American um, is um, is to do three by two miles, but start slower than 10 K pace, then a little bit faster then only on the last one do 10 K race pace. That's what I find to be a good, um, a good workout for 10 K. If you want to do it that style. We'll suggest okay. that to Bill when, uh, when the snow's gone and he starts making us do this. Yeah. I remember he, easier. He was, yeah, <laughs> I, I think that the way that it happened was that that was a workout I had gotten uh, with my previous club and I had brought it up, but it used to be just like, that was like the icing on the cake. It was like the workout of the season that yeah, was like time. that yeah, yeah, one time. And uh, he really took it to heart and he thought it was fantastic because I think a lot of the, the club members like we're running PRs in the 10K. And so like he started doing this workout like every four weeks. And I was, at one point I was just, I was toast after every single one of them. <laughs> the, the, the book actually isn't released yet. We're fairly early in the process here, or it's, or it's, maybe I should just ask the question, when is the book available and how do we get a hold of it? March 1st publication. Yeah. You know, I've been writing books for since the dark ages. Uh, the, Release dates used to mean something. They're a lot fuzzier now, but March 1st is, is the official release date. Um, I, I'm, you know, they'll, it'll be printed any minute. I can't wait for a couple of boxes to show up uh, yeah, so I can crack them open and give it the old smell test. Um, and then, you know, every, every, everywhere books are sold, there will be an audio version as well. Uh, ben and I just had the, the pleasure of choosing the actors who will, <laughs> who will do the reading for us. You don't get to read your own book? I, I've done that once. I read, I narrated How Bad You Want It, and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Like, I would rather run an ultra marathon any day than, <laughs> than, than <laughs> sit in a studio reading one of my own books. Uh, so, so no, we have some very fine bo voices representing us. I would just add that you can buy it. You can pre-order it now. Yes. Yeah. 
could okay. on Amazon, on on um, various other yeah. uh, websites. Uh, just a simple Google search should do should do the trick. But um, but you won't receive the book until March first. But okay. uh, but the pre order has begun. Um, who's the who's the, the runner on the front of the book? <laughs> uh, the runner on the foot uh, front of the book is Scott Fauble. So oh, Scott really? ran Scott, Scott ran for elite? us uh, for for he ran for Hoka NAZ Elite for let's see. Um, uh 2015 to 2020 to the end of 21 he he just made a change but don't worry i still like scott i just texted with scott this morning uh but um <laughs> but yeah we 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 put him on the front of the book i, I write about him in in the champion's mindset uh, chapter mm-hmm. i believe because he's a great example of someone who can go very very deep into the well and can um, get the absolute most out. I think some of us think we get the most out of ourselves, but Scott Fauble can absolutely get the most out of himself uh, on race day in, in a very scary way. And um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's cool to have him on the front of the book. You does to Scott. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess uh, we'll each one your turn, but uh, where can people follow you if they wanna, if they wanna follow you? see what you're up to. Yeah. My personal website is mattfitzgerald.org and, and Ben's wife, Jen actually does like, she, she manages it for me. So every time I have a new book come out, I, I email her and say, Hey, here's some copy. Here's a picture. Can you hook it up for me? So that's kind of cool. And then my kind of business website um, is 8020endurance.com. What are your social handles, Matt? Oh, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you you can you, the best way to follow me and and and, and my team uh, is to go to our website nazelite.com. It, it, I think you could really spend a lot of time on there and enjoy yourself. We've got blog posts and videos and pictures and bios and results that go all the way back to 2014 and all sorts of goodies for for runners. Um, you know, I think uh, I believe anyway. Yeah, I'm sh- I'm sure that on the front page of that website you can sign up for our newsletter. We have a weekly e-newsletter that goes out that keeps you up to date on the team. I write a little piece in, in each and every one of those newsletters. And then you can follow me on Twitter at, at Ben Rosario one or on Instagram at coach Ben Rosario one. Those are my, those are my social handles. I'll be signing up for that newsletter. I certainly follow. Yes, please. I certainly followed mm. the, the, the team, particularly when there was, you know, a race desert and everybody was training, but nobody was racing because uh, and you guys did a few sort of fairly public training sessions and they were filmed and videoed and things. And I was followed, lived vicariously through Nazalite. Thank you. That's what we're shooting for. Yeah. I, I think I saw a, um, I, I think I watch you guys more on YouTube though, but there were, there were a few like uh, interviews and things with like Steph Bruce and stuff like that. But yeah, they're really, really good. I actually kind of stalked um, Alephine's training log uh, after the after she won the um, the marathon um, trials, the trials. Yeah, the marathon trials in 2020. Uh, I was kind of curious to see like what what she did. And she did a whole lot of running. (laughs) (laughs) Shocker. I spent quite a quite a little bit of time trying to get a uh, trying to get a hat. From Malafine, me too. Uh, from Malafine, shop. Too. To, well, actually, to give to you for your for your birthday one one Aww. year, but didn't happen. Mm. They like they became like gold dust <laughs> once you once you qualified for the Olympics. <laughs> yeah, the Alephine beanies are a hot commodity. Once you, well, it really it was more about once she um, got pregnant and and then had baby Zoe. It's been really difficult to uh, to make those beanies, but yeah, they're they're very sought after. Yeah, maybe one day we'll we'll get our hands on some of those. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. No, that would be very cool, but um, we don't want to put you to a to a task. You know, you have enough tasks to do, so mm-hmm. but it would be very cool. So, should we give our summaries and let these people get on with their day jobs? Yes. Okay. So, um, I thought this book had a lot of practical advice and reminders that uh, running really is a simple sport. Uh, so, although the pros do a lot of different types of training that seem complicated, and they do things like drills. They don't seem to rely on a lot of, you know, uh, gadgets or um, or strange food practices, restrictive diets uh, and all that kind of stuff. So in that way, it's a little bit of a reminder uh, that maybe we need to kind of stick to the basics if we want to run well. And um, I like the the way that the book started off with the first chapter dedicated to explaining why we should follow the lead of the world's best runners. 
I think, um, you know, it's sometimes it's a hard sell to tell, tell us to go and do some drills and pre warm ups when you know, we just want to get on with the run. But the the first chapter really shows why we, uh, we kind of need to pay attention to to what the pros are doing. I, I also like that it mentions about recreational runners not being a fan of the sport. I think that it's true. A lot of recreational runners are are not fans of the sport and um and we should be because it's a great sport with a great community and um you know like others all the other sports have a fan base and then that fan base will practice the sport and running is a little bit the opposite it's like you start running and then one day you're like oh look i can follow these runners on um on youtube um i like the the uh, coaches tips at the end of each chapter it was a nice addition and and it, there were some good stories of you know how the advice given is is applied in real life a couple of things that i learned that stuck out for me uh, were in chapter 2 always do less than you think you can. I think I will make that my mantra next time we do our marathon training. And in chapter three, um, things like VO2 max and muscle, muscle strength decline with age, but apparently running efficiency doesn't. So that's great news. It means that we can actually uh, gain that and keep it. <laughs> so um, it, was a, it was a great read. Okay, my, my take on, on the book. Uh, I would say this is a book for anyone at any level who wants to improve at endurance running. So if you're a rank beginner or you're an almost professional, there's something in there that you can take and improve. You're not necessarily going to have to work harder from that point of view. You're basically going to probably be working smarter or adding tricks and tips to uh, to your portfolio. In particular, I think if you're an average club runner, and I see people in our club, we're all, we're all average club runners, basically. It could take you for, to something that I, I would term a wow performance, something that you probably didn't realize you could do or you didn't think you could do. So isn't that a fantastic book? If you think maybe you could take something from it and get yourself uh, an unbelievable improvement, a wow uh, factor improvement out of it. I can't think of a better way to sell the book. You know, this is just me. I'm not getting any royalties from you guys. This is just me telling you like I see it. <laughs> Checks in um, the mail, Alan. Again, that's <laughs> two checks I've got. Uh, Matt gives us the support of the sort of literature studies. And I, I think uh, one, of you, one of you touched on this, that this is how it kind of works through the book. Uh, and Ben gives us the practical, hands-on, real-world examples of how it actually works. And they both bring a wealth of knowledge and experience in an easy-to-read manner. It was a very easy book to read. And in fact, I had trouble with preparing for the podcast because I ended up just reading the book through. Normally what I do is I, I read the book, make some notes, read a little bit more book, make some more notes. Then I have a big pile of notes at the end. I got to the end of the book. I thought, oh my God, I don't have any notes. And then I had to go back <laughs> into the book. It was so readable from that point of view. Uh, among my learnings were um, more pain does not necessarily mean more gain. And you are much more capable than you think you are. In brackets, your brain tricks you. The, the exercises with the photos, um, to help sort of design your own corrective exercise drill were, were one of the highlights for me and that it, it was something that it brought that, that I haven't seen and, and it isn't in my lexicon, the sort of corrective action drills. Um, so that, that was great for me. Before we wrap up, I'd just like to, to thank you uh, for your time. Thank you for the effort and, and, and work that you put into the book. If you're a runner out there listening to this, get out there and get one on March the 1st. Um, and get your improvement before that other runner next to you gets the book. <laughs> Any last words, Ben, Matt? I'd just say thank you guys. This was wonderful and really appreciate you reading the book and having us on and all those kind words. And I look forward to folks getting their hands on this because what you guys just said confirms what I think Matt and I had hoped, which is that this is a book for anyone who wants to improve. And we know that a lot of people want to improve. Yes. Yeah, it's funny. I start the book by saying about how oddly divided the sport is with, you know, the recreational runners not necessarily even paying much attention to the pros. But yes, we are all the same at that level. We all do want to improve. We all are the same. And that, I think that's a nice theme to, uh, to end with. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Running Book Reviews podcast. Big thank you to Matt and Ben for providing a review copy of the book and for spending time with us today. If you'd like to leave us feedback about how we can improve the podcast or want to suggest a book that you'd like to review in a future episode, 
please leave us a comment on social media. We are running book reviews on Facebook and Instagram. And on Twitter, we are reviews underscore running. Please also follow us on social media to find out about new episodes when they're released or just subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform. One thing that we've added is uh, we now have a buy me a coffee page. Uh, So if you've been enjoying the podcast and, and are wondering how you can help us out, you can now go and buy us a coffee. Uh, The link will be in the description. Bye for now. now.